My name is Preston Dennett. Welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I call this episode New Mexico UFO Crash Retrievals. Of course, everyone knows about the Roswell UFO crash in 1947 and other very famous incidents around that time, possibly the Corona UFO crash, the crash on the San Augustine Plains, and definitely the Aztec UFO crash. But what many people don't know is that New Mexico has many other crashes, over a dozen in fact. And as far as I can tell, New Mexico leads the United States in the number of UFO crashes. But there are literally hundreds. It's not as uncommon as you might think. And that's why I wanted to do this video. I think UFO crash retrievals are one of the cutting edges of UFO research. This really has the most potential, I think, for real pay dirt. This is hard evidence. There are enough whistleblower accounts to, I think, safely conclude that these are real cases. And what I'd like to do today is present to you about 10 cases of UFO crash retrievals that come from the state of New Mexico alone. So that's kind of a lot. And uh, let's just get started. And the first case I want to talk about has come to be known as the UFO crash at San Antonio. This comes from two gentlemen by the name of Remigio Baca and Jose Padilla, who have co-authored a book about their experience titled Born on the Edge of Ground Zero, Living in the Shadow of Area 51. This is all about their being eyewitnesses to this UFO crash which occurred in August of 1945. And more recently, the book Trinity by UFO researchers Jacques Vallée and Paula Harris revisits this incident, which is now becoming much more well-known. So again, this occurred in August of 1945 when two young boys, again by the name of Jose Padilla and Remigio Baca, were working on the Padilla Ranch outside of San Antonio when they stumbled upon a crashed UFO complete with live occupants. And according to Remigio Baca, they were actually looking for a lost cow when they came upon this crashed UFO. As he says, what we saw was a long wide gash in the earth with a manufactured object lying cockeyed and partially buried at the end of it surrounded by a large field of debris. We believe then, and we believe today, that the object was occupied by distinctly non-human life forms, which were alive and moving about on their arrival minutes after the crash. So they both approached the site, getting quite close to it, and according to them, the area around this craft was littered with pieces of, quote, thin, shiny material which reminded them of tinfoil. And in fact, Remigio picked up one of these pieces to examine, and as he says, it was folded up and lodged beneath the rock. When I freed it, it unfolded all by itself. I refolded it, and it spread itself out again. So this is very much like the description of the Roswell UFO debris. And through a gash in the side of this craft, Remigio and Jose observed the humanoid creatures moving in quick, darting movements while making weird squeaking sounds that reminded them of a jackrabbit in pain. And Jose, who was nine years old, wanted to approach and examine the craft more closely, but Remigio, who was a little bit younger, became afraid. And as it was already getting late, they returned home they returned to their ranch on their horses to tell the owner of the ranch, a man by the name of Faustino Padilla, what had happened. And Faustino agreed to check it out. He believed it was probably a military experiment. So he contacted state policeman Eddie Apodaca, who agreed to help investigate. And two days later, Faustino Padilla and Eddie Apodaca returned with the boys to the site of the craft. And once there, however, they discovered that this site had been swept clean of debris 
and that the beings, of course, were now gone. However, the large and nearly intact body of the craft still remained, though it had been covered with dirt and debris as if to disguise it. So this craft was quite large, too big to move, so after observing it for several minutes, the witnesses returned to their ranch, and shortly later, a man shows up at the ranch and said his name was Sergeant Avila, and that a, quote, experimental weather balloon had come down on their property, and he requested permission to remove one of their fences so they could bring in some heavy equipment to remove it. And the owner of the ranch, Faustino Padilla, agreed, and on August 20th, a crane and a lowboy trailer were brought in and were used to lift the craft and carry it away. The entire operation took about five days and was observed by the two boys from a secret vantage point up on their property. And they watched as all the surrounding brute debris, whatever was left, was collected. And then the large craft was lifted up onto the flatbed truck, covered with a tarp, and hauled away. Jose Padilla says that they recovered some of the metallic debris which remained on the ranch for several years. Today, they say only two pieces remain, and both were sent for metallurgical tests, which reveal that both samples were composed of what they believe to be aluminum. Dr. Smith, who examined the samples, said that the aluminum was not normal. It has an unusually high percentage of carbon and that the metal itself has a very strange structure. As Remigio Baca says, and I quote, there is certainly something unusual about that metal. It apparently does not melt when subjected to the 2000 degree flame from an oxyacetylene torch for up to two minutes, despite the fact that aluminum silicate would be expected to melt at about 700 degrees. A blend of carbon and some other trace materials is used, which dramatically increases the conducting power, eliminating the resistance to electricity, while at the same time a transference of heat takes place. There appears to be the potential for heat shielding or computer chip manufacturing. And again, this is covered in Remigio Baca and Jose Padilla's book, Born on the Edge of Ground Zero, living in the shadow of Area 51, and in the newly published book, Trinity. It's quite an interesting case, and by all accounts appears to be legitimate, and is a very early crash in New Mexico, predating Roswell by two years. And again, it's not the only one. Here's another report in which White Sands allegedly shot down a UFO. Now this report comes from a gentleman by the name of C. John Kissner. Uh, in some accounts, his name is John Andrew Kissner, and he is labeled as a Republican state representative from Las Cruces, New Mexico. However, I was not able to verify this, and in fact, there's no evidence at all that this man actually existed that I could find. However, this account is widely published in a number of sources, so I include it here for what it's worth. And according to Kissner, uh, this was a crash which occurred only a few days before the Roswell crash, about a week, on May 29, 1947 at White Sands Proving Ground. And according to Kissner, radar technicians at White Sands observed one or more unidentified radar targets hovering to the southwest of the White Sands Proving Ground launch row. And at 7.15 p.m., one surface-to-air missile with a 674-pound atomic warhead was fired at one of these radar targets, and five minutes later, the warhead exploded at an elevation of 60,000 feet. Meanwhile, witnesses in Las Cruces including the editor of the Las Cruces Sun News and his neighbors, saw this rocket climb into the sky and move towards two star-like objects high in the sky and then explode. And apparently this tactic worked. Following this explosion, this target was tracked on radar moving south 
and 10 minutes later it impacted the earth about 30 miles to the south outside the town of Juarez, New Mexico. And also the missile itself impacted near there. Although U.S. officials attempted to go to Mexico and retrieve this object, the town of Juarez had already been closed off by Mexican officials who refused to allow anybody inside the area. And according to Kistner, whatever had crashed had been largely vaporized upon impact. Again, this is widely quoted by many researchers, including highly respected uh, British researcher Timothy Good. And the next incident I'd like to talk about I call the UFO crash in San Miguel County. And this comes from UFO researcher Robert Wood, who has basically specialized along with his son on UFO crash retrievals. And this first case first came to light in an official declassified document from the AFOSI at Tinker Air Force Base which contained a letter written by a Mr. McLean of Friona, Texas. And in the spring of 1952, Mr. McLean, who was a retired farmer, and his wife, both residents of Friona, Texas, were camping in the mountains in the eastern part of San Miguel County in New Mexico, and one evening they saw a dim light circling around up high, they said. This strange object performed a mile-wide circle and was slowly descending, and when it reached a low altitude, it suddenly turned bright green and exploded, quote, showering lighted objects in all directions. And according to this AFOSI document, Mr. McLean said, several of those fiery objects landed close to me. Most of them were buried in the ground, but I gathered up three that were only partly buried and brought them home with me. Later, he broke up open one of these strange uh, objects and says, quote, In the center was a round hole or vacuum filled with a fine powder. So he informed the Pentagon, who did not respond, and he ended up writing a letter to Senators Lyndon Johnson of Texas and Clinton Anderson of New Mexico and both senators did respond and asked that McLean send samples of the material for analysis which he did and the report that came back to him came back as meteors. Now McLean says that he was later visited by a Russian scientist who bought one of the objects from him and told McLean that the object was made of uranium and other materials. So Mr. McLean was later contacted by UFO researchers, and uh, he changed his story, saying that he had not actually seen the objects fall to Earth, despite what this document says. And he said that he had found them while driving through the area. He also said he never sold anything to a Russian scientist, but did remember being visited by an individual from the Russian consulate in Amarillo, Texas, who expressed an interest in these samples. So this case, like many UFO crash retrieval incidents, doesn't contain a whole lot of other information, but Bob Wood, who studied this case, writes, and I quote, more than a half century on, and with the key player in this case long departed, this event remains intriguingly unresolved. The next case I'd like to cover comes from researcher Leonard Stringfield, who is very well known for studying UFO crash retrievals. In fact, he's really the first major researcher, other than perhaps Frank Scully, who took UFO crash retrievals seriously and focused on them almost exclusively. And this crash occurred in an undisclosed location in New Mexico. And how it came to light was a witness contacted Leonard Stringfield and said that he was a radar specialist who had actually viewed a film of this UFO crash. According to this gentleman, 
1953, when he was only 20 years old, he was a radar specialist at Fort Monmouth in New Jersey. And while stationed there, he was given a secret security clearance. And later, he and a small group of radar specialists were summoned to view a special 16 millimeter film at the base theater. This is what he told Leonard Stringfield. And this witness, who is anonymous, says that the film opened with a desert scene and immediately apparent, uh, according to Stringfield, was, quote, a silver disc-shaped object embedded in the sand with a domed section at the top. At the bottom, a hatch or door was open. At this point, the scene in the film shifted to show a group of 10, maybe 15 military personnel standing around the craft, which appeared to be quite small, about 20 feet in diameter. The hatch itself appeared to be about an, three feet tall and one and a half feet wide. The film then showed the interior of the craft, which had only a, quote, panel with a few simple levers and muted pastel colors. The scene shifted again in this film to show three dead E.T. bodies on tables inside a tent. And as Leonard Stringfield writes, the witness, Mr. T. said the bodies appeared little by human standards and most notable were the heads, all looking alike and all being large compared to their body sizes. They looked mongoloid, he thought with small noses, mouths, and eyes that were shut. He didn't recall seeing ears or hair. The skin, he said, was leathery and ashen in color. Each wore a tight-fitting suit in a pastel color. At this point, the 16 millimeter film ended without any credits. It was only about five minutes long and seemed to the witness, Mr. T, to be filmed by an amateur. At this point, the officer in charge told the radar technicians to, quote, think about the movie and don't relate the contents to anyone. The witness obeyed, did not tell anybody, not even his wife. However, shortly after viewing the film, two top security officers told him that a UFO, presumably the one he viewed in this film, had been shot down in New Mexico, somewhere in New Mexico, in 1952. It was two weeks after viewing this film, the witness was approached again by an Air Force intelligence officer who told him, quote, forget the movie you saw, it was a hoax. So years later, Mr. T revealed his account to researcher Leonard Stringfield. At that time, he was no longer employed by the Air Force and instead he held a highly technical position in civilian life. And as Leonard Stringfield says, and I quote, Considering the credibility of my informant, I believe he saw the movie and describes the subject matter to the best of his recollection. Regarding the subject matter, he believes that the crashed craft and the dead bodies were bona fide. It would have been difficult, even by a major Hollywood studio, to have made dummy bodies look so real for use in an otherwise so makeshift film. So this does appear to be your standard, typical gray type ETs with the large heads and the grayish skin. Hard to say for sure, but it's another case of a UFO crash in New Mexico that is not well known. And there are many other, and they all seem to circle around white sands or that general area. Certainly this next case does, which involves an apparent UFO crash at white sands. And this comes from researcher Todd Zetchel. Todd Zetchel is best known for being one of the co-founders of the Citizens UFO group, Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, CAUSE. Again, I tried to verify Todd Zetchel's uh, identity. Uh, definitely, he was one of the founder, founders of the Citizens UFO Group, which was quite influential and quite active for many years. However, I could not find a single photograph of him out there. Uh, and I did find out that he was at one point 
employed by the military as an intelligence officer, which could be why his identity remains somewhat hidden. At any rate, it's a very interesting case. And according to researcher Todd Zetchel, an anonymous Army helicopter pilot who served as an aide to an Air Force general told him, told him that a crash saucer of ovoid shape was about 18 by 30 feet in diameter and had four four-foot-tall bodies of ETs in it and that this object was retrieved near White Sands in 1953 and then was later shipped to Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. And according to the witness, Air Force personnel found the craft in perfect condition with the doors wide open. All four occupants were dead, though no cause of death could be found. The bodies were reportedly hairless, but otherwise very much human looking. Because of his association with the general, the witness along with him, the general, viewed the bodies and the craft Inside the craft, they were puzzled because there was no visible means of controlling or propelling the craft. They were also shown three other UFO craft that had been recovered, and these craft were about 25 feet long and 13 feet wide. According to the witness, despite many years of intense research, leading scientists have been unsuccessful in discovering the means of propulsion of this recovered craft. So this, doesn't re this case does not rest solely on Todd Zetchel. In 1977, researcher Richard Hall spoke with an anonymous lieutenant colonel who confirmed the incident and said that he had seen four of these bodies at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia and was told that they had been, quote, recovered from a crash in 1953 near White Sands, New Mexico. So this case has been widely quoted, not only by Richard Hall, uh, by Leonard Stringfield in his status reports, and of course by UFO researcher Robert Wood. The next case I'd like to talk about is a UFO crash at Walker Air Force Base. And this occurred in 1954, and again comes from researcher Leonard Stringfield, who interviewed an anonymous witness who goes by the initials K.A. According to Stringfield, in early 1954, K.A. completed his basic training at Sampson Air Force Base in Geneva, New York. He was then immediately sent to Walker Air Force Base near Roswell, where he began, quote, special training in the Sikorsky H-19 helicopter, in relation to desert search and rescue operations. K.A. told researchers Fred Schaefer, Gerald Misker, and Linda Robinson that on the evening of April 12, 1954, he and his crew were told to launch a search and rescue mission for a crash in the deserts of New Mexico. This was published in Leonard Stringsfield's Status Report Number 3, and according to Stringfield, the crash site was located about 25 miles away from Walker Air Force Base out in the desert wilderness. And according to K.A., and I quote, As we flew overhead at an altitude of about 40 feet, we could plainly see below us the outline of a round silver object. At this point, the stranger in the cockpit gave the order to turn on the spotlight. When the light was turned on, we saw below us a round metallic saucer-like object approximately 40 to 50 feet in diameter. The craft appeared to have crashed edgewise into the sand. According to K.A., there were four small bodies, each about four and a half feet long, dressed in dark blue tight-fitting uniforms scattered outside the craft, each of which had, quote, extremely large heads which were out of proportion with the rest of their bodies. K.A. was ordered to photograph the bodies, which he did, though he was not allowed to approach any closer than 40 feet. He says that an overpowering stench came from the bodies, which caused one of the ground crew to actually vomit. 
He talked to another member of the ground crew who learned that there were two more bodies inside the craft. After photographing these bodies and the craft, K.A. was then removed from the scene. And the next three days, says K.A., were a, quote, living hell. He says he was interrogated for three days straight regarding the incident, being alternately asked what happened and then told that he did not see anything. And one day after finally being released from interrogation, he was flown back over the crash site, which appeared as if it had been, quote, gone over with a fine-toothed comb. And one of the interrogating intelligence officers told him, See, I told you guys that you didn't see anything. Of course, rumors on the base were that the craft and bodies had been recovered and secreted at the base, and later, K.A.'s superior accused him of having leaked the incident, which he denied. K.A. was then accused of going AWOL and was summarily dismissed from the Air Force, having served for less than four months. According to K.A., the stories about the movie in the movie Hangar 18 about crashed UFOs stem specifically from this incident as the craft itself was allegedly stored in Hangar 18, after which it became top security, and according to K.A., and I quote, no one but top brass could enter or leave the area. K.A. says that the hangar was totally reconstructed. He was able to speak with one of the construction workers who told him that it was expanded, quote, to a height of nine stories and a depth of 11 stories, and that heavy equipment and large computers were also installed. K.A. also heard that another UFO crash occurred only a few weeks later on April 24, 1954, near Bandelier, New Mexico, and after speaking with researcher Leonard Stringfield, K.A. continued to receive threats and warnings not to talk about his role in this incident. K.A. says he has suffered from nightmares ever since this ordeal occurred, and he and his wife continue to fear government reprisals. So I think this is a reason why probably what we're hearing about UFO crash retrievals is really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, this is a very serious situation. People have lost their lives for coming forward. And uh, this goes to show that there are far more UFO crashes than we realize. And our government does, in fact, have these materials, these craft, these bodies in their possession. There are so many of these incidents being reported. Another case comes from UFO researcher Robert Wood, and this one is a UFO crash at Clovis, New Mexico. This is a small town, and in the summer of 1957, possibly 1958, an anonymous former Air Force officer was traveling through New Mexico when he heard that a crash of some kind involving an unusual aircraft had occurred at a ranch about 30 miles southwest of Clovis. At the time, he was in the military and he was intrigued. So he and two of his Air Force buddies decided that they would trek to the site in hopes of examining this craft. And upon arrival, they saw numerous military vehicles in the area and that this area was scattered with small pieces of, quote, unusual lightweight wreckage. So here again, we have echoes of Roswell long before Roswell had become public. And th this witness and his friends could see evidence that, quote, something large had hit the ground. However, before they had a chance to examine the area and get closer, he and his friends were approached by military personnel and were ordered to leave and remain silent about the incident. So there you go, another incident. And there's another one not long after that involving an apparent UFO crash not far away at Holloman Air Force Base. 
And this report comes from longtime researcher Robert D. Barry, UFO researcher for many years and would lecture on this topic. And according to Robert D. Barry, on June 12, 1962, officials at Holloman Air Force Base tracked a UFO that appeared to be having flight difficulties across two southwestern states. And when this object came over New Mexico, military jets were set up to intercept it. At this point, this craft, which was described as circular, seemed to lose control and began to descend. And moments later, it impacted bottom first into the sands at an estimated 90 miles per hour. And according to Robert D. Barry, and I quote, this craft was 68 feet in diameter and 13 feet in height, typically circular. Two beings were discovered inside the craft and they were 42 inches in height. Each being was donned in a one-piece suit that contained no buttons or zippers. This is certainly what we hear in all the other accounts. Researcher Kevin Randall also looked into this case and reported on it. And according to Kevin Randall, the craft was dull aluminum in color and had skidded for a distance on the ground, leaving a trench. According to Robert D. Berry's source, he said that the heads of the ETs were abnormally large, the eyes larger than normal, with small thin lips, and only an ear hole for an ear. Their skin color was a grayish pink, and the creatures were believed to have died upon impact. They were immediately removed and placed in a secret location for study. They certainly do sound like your typical grays. The craft the witness learned later was allegedly an exploratory craft. It was also removed and taken to a secret location for study, and Robert D. Berry's source writes that only 20 individuals were actually involved in the retrieval and investigation, and that three of them had actually died. According to Kevin Randall, this craft was taken back to Holloman Air Force Base, with sections of it being distributed to Los Alamos and other research installations. Leonard Stringfield also wrote about this in his status reports, and he writes, quote, there are more and stronger data concerning the 1962 Mexico crash which are not publishable at this writing. And Stringfield never did reveal this data, but did say, quote, the 1962 crash site was near Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico, and that this incident is known by an astronaut who prefers anonymity. There you go, another crash. And here's another very intriguing case, which comes from abduction researcher, the late Bud Hopkins. This is a very unusual incident, which occurred in the small town of Santa Rosa, New Mexico. And the main witness is an x-ray technician who allegedly goes by the name of Beanie, or his nickname Beanie. And this occurred in early 1963, when this anonymous medical technician was working in a hospital in the small town of Santa Rosa. She was not a registered nurse, but it was her job to do x-rays and ride with the patients in the ambulance. This was a very small hospital with only one doctor and a few rooms because the town and the hospital were so small. Uh, things were usually very quiet and slow, and therefore when accidents occurred, they were considered big news and genera generated considerable gossip for weeks afterwards. But this particular incident was different. It started out normally when the hospital received a call from the town's only police dispatcher that there had been, quote, a crash with fatalities. So Beanie, the main witness, and the ambulance driver raced 18 miles from the hospital to the scene of the accident. And when they arrived, there were two police cars and two state troopers on the scene. And on the ground, there were three bodies, each three and a half feet tall and very badly burned. 
and the witness assumed that they were children and asked the state trooper, where are the parents? And this state trooper replied enigmatically, I don't think they have parents. This is something unusual we have here. And she asked him, what is this? And he said, I'm going to have to notify the Air Force. I don't know what this is. So this witness um, from Bud Hopkins is still thinking this is children, but she's 10 feet away from the bodies and looking at this vehicle, which is right there, she sees, quote, a pile of wreckage of metal. And it was about the size of one or two cars. So she bent down and checked for signs of life with her stethoscope and found no sounds of life, thinking that they might possibly still be alive. She and the ambulance driver quickly put the bodies on gurneys and loaded them into the ambulance. And she said that when she did this, the bodies oozed some kind of brownish colored fluid. They returned to the hospital and the witness immediately took the bodies to the x-ray room and x-rayed them. She was eager for the doctor to examine them because they looked so strange with very thin bodies and very large heads, which reminded her of photos she had seen of children dying of famine in Africa. So the doctor came in, and after examining the bodies, pronounced them dead, and he started filling out the reports and signing the necessary paperwork, at which point an Air Force colonel stormed into the hospital and demanded that the bodies be removed. He then, according to the main witness, Beanie, proceeded to remove, quote, every single thing he could that bore on this trip. And he asked the witness, do you have any notes? She said, yes, and he took them away. He unhooked the x-rays, which were hanging up on a wire drying. She said, you can't take those, they're still wet. And he replied, I'm taking the x-rays. After removing the bodies and everything associated with them, the Air Force colonel and his associates descended upon the ambulance and retrieved the evidence from there. And according to Bud Hopkins, who interviewed the main witness, the Air Force took every single thing they could out of the back of it. The sheets, any objects, anything movable, cleaned out the whole thing. She said, we were never paid for anything. So after removing all the evidence of the event, the Air Force colonel approached the witnesses and threatened them not to talk, saying, quote, this did not happen. You are never to speak about this, and remember this, the government has a long arm. According to the witness, and again I quote, what was so strange was that whenever we had a fatality, a wreck, a crash, we would all be down in the cafe going over the details and talking about it as it was a big event in our area. But nobody ever mentioned that. There was some kind of understanding or fear not to mention it. I have no idea what it was we had there. Of course, she is now convinced that these bodies were not human and that they had become unwitting participants in a UFO crash retrieval. This witness remained silent for years, but finally contacted UFO researcher Bud Hopkins, who revealed the details of this case in the 2003 UFO crash retrieval conference in Laughlin, Nevada. Researcher Kevin Randall looked into this case, and he had some doubts about it, because apparently the main witness uh, said that there were two bodies, when in initially she had said three. Uh, but Bud Hopkins of, is, of course, absolutely convinced that this case is legitimate. And even if it's not, there's always another one to take its place. Uh, this next case occurred in the Manzano Mountains. I call this the Manzano Mountains UFO crash, and this comes from a researcher from APRO, their Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. His name is R.C. Hecker. And this incident allegedly occurred on May 17, 1974, at around 10.22 p.m. An anonymous gentleman who worked at Kirtland Air Force Base's East Manzano Labs was monitoring electrical scanning instruments 
and saw that the sensors had observed an unexplained burst of energy in the range of 250 megahertz. This blast was so intense that it threw all the instruments off scale, and the source was quickly traced to an object in a certain location in the Earth's upper atmosphere. A trajectory was plotted which showed that this object had just descended down to the east side of the Manzano Mountains about 30 miles southwest of Albuquerque. This employee later learned that this object had allegedly crashed just outside the town of Chile, New Mexico. A team was sent to locate the object, which was immediately surrounded and cordoned off, and within hours, this object, which was described as metallic, circular, and about 60 feet in diameter, was dismantled and secretly moved into an unidentified hangar at the base. And according to R.C. Hecker, who interviewed the gentleman who worked at this base, he writes, and I quote, This individual has given me leads to sightings in the past which have always proved valid. After being told of this incident, I was stopped by a man who identified himself as a Kirtland Air Force Base officer, and he ordered me to forget everything I had been told about this incident. So this is another case that has been fairly widely written about in the UFO literature by Kevin Randall, by Timothy Good, and others. So it appears to be a legitimate case. And as can be seen, New Mexico has an enormous number of UFO crash retrieval incidents. Uh, and it is apparent that our government is lying about this and that they do, in fact, not only have material from otherworldly vehicles, as was insinuated by the Pentagon, but have the actual craft and the ET bodies, and that people who pursue research in this area or who are whistleblowers are doing so at their own risk. Just considered what happened to Clifford Stone, who is a well-known proponent of UFO crash retrieval incidents. Sergeant Clifford Stone had investigated many crash retrievals and was a vocal critic of the military policy regarding UFOs. And on June 21st, 1987, a news article about Clifford Stone's research appeared in the Roswell Daily Record. And according to Clifford Stone, immediately following the publication of this article, his supervisors at the New Mexico Military Institute, where he was assigned at that time, began to treat him differently. His efficiency ratings, which had always been excellent, began to receive lower scores, He's, he was relieved of his position as an administrative non-commissioned officer and was assigned to a low-level filing position. He was then sent to Fort Bliss for a psychological evaluation, which found that he was, in fact, normal, but the harassment continued. And on February 1st, 1988, Clifford Stone filed an affidavit with the 4th ROTC Region Inspector General, alleging that he was being wrongfully forced to retire from the Army. Army officials have refused to comment on his case, but Clifford Stone said that he believes that officials are displeased with the fact that he has sent numerous letters to New Mexico's Republican Senator Pete Domenici questioning various UFO incidents. So he still remained a vocal critic of the government and an advocate saying that UFO crash retrievals do in fact happen. So those are the cases from New Mexico that I wanted to present to you today. Again, I didn't talk about Roswell or the Aztec crash or the other ones surrounding that. I already covered them in my YouTube episode, the top 20 cases in New Mexico. But as you can see, New Mexico has an awful lot of UFO crashes. It's hard to account for these. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, and it's clear that these are not the only ones. I've written a number of books about various states, and they occur, these crashes in 
pretty much every state I've researched. I wrote about these cases in my book, UFOs Over New Mexico. And I think it's clear from these eyewitness testimonies that these cases do, in fact, occur. And judging from the fact that this information is so very vigorously and ruthlessly covered up, we can safely assume that there are many other cases like these that we never hear about. It appears that our own government is neck deep involved in this subject, has the material, and is lying about it. Just recently in the congressional hearings, they were asked about whether or not they had material from otherworldly vehicles, and they flat out said no. So I think that's probably a lie. We are still at this point relying on eyewitness testimony. While there are, is allegedly some of these materials in the public arena, this remains quite controversial. But I still think that UFO crash retrievals are one of the cutting edges of UFO research, the one that has the greatest potential to actually prove the reality of UFOs and the alien presence on our planet. And that's really why I wanted to do this video for you today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I want to thank you once again for watching. I truly appreciate it. Until next time, keep searching for answers. Keep digging for the truth. And most importantly, keep having fun.